Welcome to Statistically Insignificant, a podcast with slides about statistics that will never go viral. That's our guarantee. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she and they, and I will be your statistician in this process. With me is Bart. Hi, Bart. Hey, how's it going? My pronouns are he and him. And since the last episode, I've got COVID, which I now consider to be an act of gonzo journalism. <laughs> Have you been uh, doing endless commentary on your experience? Absolutely. And I'm sure I will be able to use this uh, personal experience for today's episode about statistics. It might actually come up realistically. <laughs> yeah. So we're recording this in early January 2022, and Australia is currently facing its biggest caseload of COVID yet, with the Omicron variant arriving just as some states were relaxing containment rules from the Delta variant wave. As such... A lot of people are doing tests for COVID, both administered at testing clinics and now at home testing with various rapid antigen kits. We're going to talk about the testing process, the different ways that such tests are considered more or less effective, and use this as a bit of a case study to talk about statistical testing in general. Everything we discuss here can be applied to hypothesis tests more generally the ways we measure the effectiveness of a test, as well as the types of error that occur. The Australian government has released ratings for various co rapid tests based on something called sensitivity, with acceptable, high, and very high levels. To understand what sensitivity is, we need to talk about the way that errors behave in testing. In episode 8, we introduced the idea of a hypothesis test, and we will deal with the result of a COVID test like this too. Our null hypothesis is that the person does not have COVID. We call this a negative result of the test. Our alternative is that the person does have COVID, which is a positive test result. Now, when you are developing a test for a disease, you have to determine what counts as sufficient evidence for the test to return a positive result. In our hypothesis testing framework, sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis that the person does not have COVID in favor of the alternative that they do. Antigen tests do this by detecting the presence of COVID antigens, which are a chemical marker of the virus itself. There is some threshold of antigens in a sample that is considered a positive result, below which is either negative or inconclusive. We won't really be dealing with inconclusive results today. We'll just look at the simpler case of a positive or a negative. Does this mean that you would naturally have some of the antigens, the chemicals in your body without having had COVID? I don't, well, look, I don't know enough about uh, body physiology to answer for sure, but what I think is going on is that this is a particular protein structure that is unique to the virus in the sense that it is basically attached on the outside of the virus. It's not a cell, but let's call it the virus itself, like one particle of virus. Uh, I believe that your immune system, one of the ways it has memory for viruses is that it can produce is that once it learns to do so it can produce its own antigens but wow. uh that's like a record keeping thing that it uses basically it it has this antigen chemical and that it keeps track of to say if this shows up again i will cause an immune response right yeah but i think that it would not otherwise exist in the body because your body would not otherwise produce it yeah, so that's kind of that context. Generally, the memory, the immune system memory levels of antigens are very low. Yes. Would that be, um, would that be how the vaccine works as well, in terms of setting that into place? I don't know. Um, I haven't, I haven't read up on it, but I think one of the ways that it could work is that it would produce some sort of antigen that causes an immune response. I don't, right. I don't know if that is the way that this particular vaccine works. And as, as mentioned, right, you, if you are not infected currently, but you have um, got some of this running around from your immune system, you probably will have a bit of it. So when you are designing a test based on this, there really is, a, you have to choose the threshold at which something is considered a positive result. Some of that will depend on what you can detect. Like chances are that there is a like level of concentration in your sample below, like you can't detect below that. Because um, if there's like one or two of these mo molecules in your sample, that's probably not gonna show up. Right. Yeah, it's, 
I don't know what concentration they require in order for like the level of detection, which is that minimum threshold at which you could actually detect a result one way or another. But it does exist. Like every detector has this sort of a thing going on. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. So we have two possible test results, positive and negative. But we also have two possible situations for the individual. They are either infected or they are not infected. So this gives us kind of four situations, right? If you'll excuse my incredibly shitty drawing lines. If our person is infected, then our test will hopefully return a positive result. We call this a true positive TP. Otherwise, this reflects the true situation for an infected person. But you don't always get a positive result for an infected person. The test may have been faulty, there may have been sample contamination, or the sample wasn't taken properly, or there just weren't enough antigen pre antigens present at the time to pick up. Whatever the case, if you have an infected person who gives a negative result, this is a false negative, a negative result that does not reflect the truth. So these two cover the options if the person is infected. If they aren't infected, we have the other two. If the test returns a negative result, this is a true negative. Oh, sorry, that's a false negative, not a false positive. <laughs> My brain's not on right today. But if you have somebody who is not infected, but the test gives a positive result, which does happen, this is a false positive. Or authoritarian right. <laughs> so we have two ways of being wrong here. A false negative and a false positive. False negatives reflect failure to detect the disease, and a false positive is when the test mistakenly says that there is disease present. In the lab, when you're developing the test, you can know the true situation, these things at the top, right? You can prepare a sample which either has the virus present or doesn't, or has the antigens present or doesn't. That lets you determine whether you have a true or false result, positive or negative. Out in the wild, you don't have that information. If you knew the actual infection status of the person before te you tested them, you wouldn't need to do the test. So what you have as information is just the test outcome, these bits. You then have to use the results that came out of that clinical trials and other general information to kind of infer what you think the actual result is. Generally, you assume a positive result is a true positive, a negative result is a true negative. The best you have is really that understanding of the test performance from the lab's results. You don't know the true information. Sensitivity is one metric for measuring the performance. If we consider all of the people who are infected and take the test, the percentage of true results is the sensitivity. So true results among the infected, right? So we have true positives divided by true positives plus false negatives, right? Because this is everybody who was infected. Yeah. If these are numbers, we then multiply by 100 to get a percentage. Mm -hmm. This tells you how good the test is at detecting disease that is present. Then 100% uh, minus sensitivity is the percentage false negatives. There's no mention in this of people who aren't infected. There is another statistic called specificity, which is the corresponding percentage, but for the uninfected. So this is the true negatives divided by the total number of uninfected people, which is true negatives plus false positives times 100%. 100% minus the sensitivity, sorry, specificity, terminology confuses me on a regular basis, gives <laughs> you the percentage false positive. So is specificity that useful? As yes. A... Well, it's very relevant, right? Because if you have, and we'll get to this um, when we talk a bit more about like how these two interact, but if everybody gets diagnosed as positive, you've got a problem. Yeah. This tells you the percentage of unaffected people who see a negative result. When we're right. building a test, whether it's a COVID test or some other hypothesis test in some other context, there is a trade-off between false negatives and false positives for the same amount of information anyway. You can have better performance with more information, bigger sample size, better test, whatever. In the extreme, as I just mentioned, you can have a situation where you guarantee no false negatives. 
You simply return a positive result every time. This gives you 100% sensitivity. But because every <laughs> single uninfected person would also get a positive result, you get 0% specificity. Yeah. The other extreme is also possible. Every result is negative, you never have a false positive, but you also can't ever detect the disease. Typically, you aim for somewhere between these two, with both as high as possible. How you weigh these thresholds is a risk assessment. A false negative for COVID means that you can have somebody who may go out and spread a contagious, potentially lethal disease. A false positive may mean that the person loses a lot of money due to missed shifts at work, they have to isolate and deal with the distress, or if they are, for example, a nurse in a hospital or a doctor in a hospital, the health system creaks with their absence because there is no fat in the system and no ability to deal with missing staff. I feel like there's broader problems than just the... Uh, <laughs> oh, absolutely, right? Just the uh, so testing we, on that one. Oh, absolutely. But in general, we have the ability to mitigate the impact of a false positive, right? If the risk of a false positive is that somebody loses shifts at work, give them some money. Let that be not a risk for them. Let that not endanger their housing or their food or whatever. Absolutely. Likewise, with the um, hospital stuff, the mitigation there is to have enough staff that you can account for missing people, to have enough financial support within the system that there's, there's flexibility, I guess. Yeah. But fuck us, we're not going to do that. Right? <laughs> Government is just determined not to do anything like that. When it comes to communicable diseases during a pandemic, the risk of a false negative is typically considered more important to control than false positives, which is precisely what the sensitivity tells us. The Therapeutic Goods Association uses more than that to certify the test in the first place, but this sensitivity is what the Australian government has used to give their ranking of these rapid tests at home. Yep. So the ranking system is greater than 80% sensitivity, is considered acceptable. And I will point out, this means one in five tests is a false negative. Approximately because this percentage is based on the clinical trials, not the real world samples, etc, etc. It's an estimate, right? Yeah. Greater than 90% sensitivity is high, which would give you one in 10 false negatives. And greater than 95% is very high which is one in 20 false negatives. There's a, a TGA page about this linked in the show notes that gives you basically a list of the different brands of rapid tests and which of these rankings they get. Would or should they be marked on the tests themselves when you go buy them? Um, I don't know. I think, I, I think that putting this statistic on the test would be meaningless to the vast majority of people. The... Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is part of why I'm doing this show, uh, because this is something that you don't get taught in high school, even if you do the math subjects that have statistics in them. Like, you don't really get taught this. Um, and for the average person in the street, it's not going to mean a hell of a lot. I would like that to be better explained. And on the TGA page, info page about this, they link to like an information sheet about this sort of testing and what false negatives, false positive, whatever else. It's a bit hard to pass, which is one of the reasons that I think presenting it in this way is a little bit easier to deal with, particularly having somebody ask questions. Fantastic. But surely even just having 80% compared to 95%, you might not exactly know what that means, but you will... Yeah, you can see that one higher. is better, for sure. Yeah. But, like, at the moment, it doesn't. it's pretty meaningless anyway, because nobody can get a test in the first place, right? Absolutely. If all you have available is something at 80%, take it. Right. Once, once things become more readily available, I think uh, like the consumers will be a little more judicious. At that point, it's worth having the ranking system available. Uh, I can imagine that manufacturers are not particularly keen to put it on, he on their boxes anyway. They don't put a lot of statistics on them, to be perfectly honest. I mean, it'd be nice if we had some state-run manufacturing in this country, but anyway. Oh, wouldn't it just? <laughs> <laughs> so if all you can get is something with the acceptable rating, one way to be more sure that you've detected the illness if you are infected is to test twice if the first one comes back negative. Two tests giving false negatives is much less likely than just one, though you do have the probability of a false positive on the second test to consider. 
uh, one of the reasons that I say test twice if the first one comes back negative is that if the first one comes back po- positive, you treat it like a positive result anyway, right? Yeah, get a PCR done. Yeah, this is why rapid... Uh, so the false positive thing is why rapid test results are often followed up by more reliable testing with PCR, as you just mentioned. I suspect that going forward, governments will use rapid testing as a more widespread screening process on the lab tests to ease resources off of pathology places. I think they're already doing this, but I suspect it's kind of become more systematic. At the moment, everything's a bit chaotic because we don't have any federal efforts to actually support this. It's very annoying. (laughs) I'm not going to stick like an actual calculation of probability on this. Because if you take two tests, they're not going to be independent. The result from the second and the first, there's probably going to be a relationship there. So you can't easily do a computation like just say, oh, I'll multiply the probabilities as you would if they were independent tests. At some point, we'll have a whole episode on statistical independence. For the moment, I will just say two test results is a better way of detecting diseases. The first one is negative. It's more reliable. It's not guaranteed. So as mentioned, sensitivity and specificity aren't the only things we care about. Because of the trade-off between the different error types, we need to consider what positive or negative results represent. For a positive test result, we have what is called the positive predictive value, PPV. This is the percentage of positive results that are true positives, that reflect uh, infected people. So this is true positives divided by true positives plus false positives. And we have the corresponding negative predictive value, NPV, which is your true negatives divided by true negatives plus false negatives times 100 to get a percentage, right? What's the predictive value referred to here? How reliable a positive or negative result is. Basically, if I have a positive result in front of me, how likely is it that that represents somebody who is actually infected or not? Same with the negative result. Yeah, okay, great. To meaningfully calculate these, we actually need to have an idea of what proportion of the population is infected, which I'll demonstrate. We call it the pre-test probability, the probability that a randomly selected person would be infected. Let's imagine we have 1,000 people. 50% of them infected, which gives us 500. And 50% of them are not infected, which is another 500 people. We're going to have a particular test here. We're going to slightly change the um, population that is infected and uninfected and use the same test again. But our test has 99% sensitivity and 95% specificity. Now let's draw up that matrix, right? So we've got positive results, negative results, infected, not infected. So if our test sensitivity is 99%, which is quite high, 99% of our infected people will get a positive result. So that is 495 out of 500, with five people getting a false negative. Our specificity being 95%, So 95% of 500 uninfected people get a negative result, which is 475 true negative results, and 5% get a false positive, which is 25 people. Our PPV, our positive predictive value, is then 495 divided by 495, which is the true positives, plus the false positives, 25, which is 495 divided by 520, which gives us 95.2%. So if you have a positive result in front of you, there's a 95% probability that that reflects somebody who actually is infected, right? Oh, yes. These are times 100 to get a percent as well. Let's have a look at our negative predictive value. So this is our true negatives, 475, divided by true negatives, plus false negatives times 100 gives us 475 on 480 times 100, which is 98.95%. So a negative result, 98.95% of those will reflect people who are not infected. This is pretty good. 
you can be relatively sure in this case that the result in front of you reflects what's actually going on with the person. Let's drop that infected proportion, say from 50% to 10%. So we still have 1,000 people, but this time we have 100 infected, 900 not infected. Let's draw up our table again and let's run some numbers. The same test would give us 99 positive results among the infected, one negative result, but among the uninfected, we would have 855 true negatives, right? That's our 95% and 45 mm -hmm. false positives. So already we can see here that among the positive results, a far higher proportion are false. Up here it was 25 compared to nearly 500. Here it's 45 and 100. Yeah. So our positive predictive value is going to be 99 on 99 plus 45, which is 99 on 144, which is 68. That's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> Far out. Really so, trying to get 69 up there. I know, I know, I'm doing my best. <laughs> it, it rounds up. I mean, 68.8% uh, as your positive predictive value. So about two thirds of positive results actually reflect somebody who is infected with the disease. A negative predictive value, we're going to have 855 divided by 855 plus one <laughs> <laughs> times 100 is 855 divided by 856, which gives us 90 times 100, 99.9%. .9%. So negative results quite reliable, positive yeah. results not so much. So a disease that is less common is also less likely to be indicated by a positive result. In a situation where a very small proportion of the population are actively ill with COVID, the false positive rate starts to pile up. This is why the lab tests have a whole bunch of checks and infected people can get confirmation tests done. Rapid tests in particular probably need this sort of follow-up for positive results until the point when we are just saturated and everyone has COVID. It's coming, <laughs> unfortunately. I'm not, I'm not very optimistic about my chances at, of avoiding it. You've already had it. So, you know, yeah, hopefully yeah. you don't get it again. I'm less concerned about it now that I'm vaxxed up, honestly. Yeah, me too. And I've but... just had three days of fever, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the vaccination covers it, helps against severe disease as well against catching it in the first place. Absolutely. I mean, I don't think that justifies our government's let it rip approach, but it does help to be on the receiving end of it. Yeah, it's cost-benefit analysis as well. Like, yeah. It would be difficult to enforce another lockdown, I would suggest. Yeah, at but... This point. Absolutely, but there are certainly things that could be done to mitigate, like stop forcing people to go to work, for example. Mask mandates are back in place in a lot of areas, but I mean, the number of people I know who are still being forced to go into office jobs instead of working from home, it's ridiculous. And like a lot of like non-essential retail, let's call it, which could be done on, as online shopping, still having people walk in, sniff all the merchandise, lick everything, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Pay people to stay home. Just just give people money, it will help. Anyway. <laughs> but that's not what a government's for. <laughs> yeah. The government is I... to support the capital. Mm, it's true. So we have some idea of false negatives and false positives, that they exist, how frequently they occur. We can adopt policies which account for those, particularly for the false positives. But the government isn't doing that, of course, because that would require supporting people who need support. There's another wrinkle that I want to talk about, which is how test performance changes over time as like your disease progresses. The human body is messy and complex and very rarely corresponds to the neat statistical systems we like to use. Someone who has been exposed to COVID, like Bart, for example, who has the disease developing in the next few days, won't immediately register as infected after exposure. The virus hasn't taken hold and started to replicate. There just isn't enough in the system for it to show up in a chemical test like this. So there isn't really a clear binary point where we can say, ah oh yes, so many cells have been infected and started producing the virus. That means this person has the disease because Early on, even if you are immune in the sense that your immune system 
doesn't become overwhelmed and unable to cope, you're probably going to have a few cells that get infected. You can't necessarily prevent that, and we certainly can't detect it. So this comes down to that kind of threshold at which does something is considered a positive result. But you use the same test on day two and day five. So the threshold at which something is detectable on day five may not reflect your infection status on day two. Which is more likely to have the higher... Day five. Day five. So yeah, so if you, if you imagine that yeah. like somebody who has been exposed and like is developing the disease, right? If we think about this as viral load, this is time, then at the exposure, you don't have anything in your system. It spikes and then it comes down again. Now that, that decline may be quite gentle in terms of like the detectability of these antigens because yeah. the antigens can hang around in your system even after you are no longer sick. This is why like people are reporting positive antigen tests several days after they've recovered. Are they there when you're no longer infectious? Is yeah, so it appears to be the case. Um, this is why the advice around isolating is changing. We don't necessarily know how long someone is infect infectious because that seems to change with the different um, strains. So yeah. I, I don't know nearly enough about how, what's going on there to make any informed commentary. I'm just saying that this is roughly what it would look like. This affects the sensitivity because early on in the infection, there probably isn't enough of these antigens around to be picked up. The false negative result can be really high in the first few days. Number I saw last year with the earlier strains was like 80% false negatives or 20% sensitivity in the first day or two after exposure. So what you typically see, and I'm not going to put numbers on this because I don't have that information, is this is like time and this is your sensitivity. So sensitivity starts really low, goes up, mirrors what happens with the viral load really, and then kind of drops off. Right. Yeah. Um, so it would that, with that being the case, would, would the idea be to wait a day or two before taking the test if you've got the like if you know when the exposure is from. Yeah, that's the um, general advice that I have seen. If you're symptomatic, you can go and do it anyway. But if you're not symptomatic, it's generally a good idea to wait a couple of days. Notice that this also means, right, that over in this end, you are more likely to get a false positive. So your specificity goes up towards the end of the uh, period when you have the, when you have the um, antigens running around in your body. Yeah. The question, of course, there becomes, well, it's not a binary process, right? There is not a set time at which you are no longer sick or you are no longer infectious. And even if we have an idea of what that duration is like on an individual level, like any summary statistic, it may or may not be a reasonable reflection of what happens. Yeah. So it's all very complex and very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> This is also why isolation policies last for days and require negative results at the end of that period. All this does not mean that testing is useless. It's very good information to have and absolutely essential to managing spread if you have a government that's willing to introduce measures to do that. For people who are immune compromised like myself, having an idea of how prevalent a virus is in the community gives me information to consider my own risk in doing things. I turned down a New Year's Eve party because case numbers were skyrocketing. And that's not a risk I want to take, even though I would love to see those people. Do you know why they've taken down the isolation time when you've got it from 10 days to 7? My best guess, having not read into it, is it's a combination of uh, political and medical stuff. On the medical side, Omicron appears to hit earlier. You get, uh, like, in, in a couple of days, as opposed to, like, up to 14 days, as we were seeing for the Alpha variant. On the other side, they really want people to go back to work. <laughs> right and that is driving so much of the current government policy in australia it's just psychotic really like yeah or sadistic even i mean there, there is no willingness to acknowledge that actually people might need support and actually it's a fucking good idea to have people isolating when they can our mailbag this week is also covid related so we're going to look at infection risk versus hospitalization risk the New South Wales government had to reverse course and reintroduce a bunch of things like mask wearing and QR code check-ins with the spike in cases over the new year. 
They resisted doing so for a while on the basis that while case numbers were going up, ICUs went full. We are now seeing the hubris of this decision because we are seeing record number of cases in hospital. (laughs) What they were optimistically looking at was the apparently lower risk of hospitalization and death with the Omicron variant compared to Delta or previous. A disease that's half as likely to put you in hospital is less dangerous to the health infrastructure, right? Right? Right. (laughs) The problem is that this has to be weighed against how infectious the disease is, and also the lag time between case numbers rising and hospitalization of those cases. We're going to talk about the first of those here. So imagine two diseases. The first one hospitalizes 2% of those infected. The second, 1%. The second also infects twice as many people in the same period of time as the first. (laughs) I can see where this is going. Yep. (laughs) So let's say that's 2,000 people, and we've got 1,000 infected here. This is not really what's meant by twice as infectious, but it's an example we can use to talk about risk. I am talking about the number of people infected in a period of time. I am not talking about the effective R number which you may have heard of in the news, or like infection rates with exponential growth. We're going much simpler than that. B has infected twice as many people in the same amount of time. So we would expect to see about the same number of people hospitalized. So if we have 2% of 1,000 people, that's 20 people. If we have 1% of 2,000 people, that's also 20 people. So the strain on the healthcare system in terms of hospitalized patients would be the same. Plus, you have to deal with the higher probability in the case B of hospital staff getting infected and having to take time off or being ill or whatever, right? Yeah. You can scale this impact based on how different the diseases are. For example, Omicron appears to be considerably more infectious than Delta was, or at the very least, is being is both more infectious and has fewer controls impeding its infection rate. So we are seeing 10 times as many cases as we did in the Delta wave in Sydney. I also read that it might not be as uh, less deadly as first promised when it came around. Yeah. Also, how deadly it is depends directly on how overloaded your hospital system is. <laughs> It's great. We're going to see a lot of people dying, and I don't want to. (laughs) Yeah, so I wouldn't necessarily draw, like, direct numerical comparisons from this. This is a very, like, rudimentary way of presenting the numbers. But it does give you an idea of why being optimistic about hospitalization rates in the absence of data about how infectious something is, bad idea. This is why public health experts were really freaking out when the New South Wales government seemed determined to continue opening up. And we're seeing the case numbers here explode exactly as I anticipated. I'm not convinced that another hard lockdown would work. Uh, as you mentioned, enforcing it would be an issue. And also, like, we saw with Delta the limitations of what lockdowns can do. The lockdown in New South Wales in particular did slow the growth of Delta cases. There were many fewer than there would have otherwise been. But in the absence of material support for people, It's very difficult. It's really hard. And it's psychologically distressing, even if you have a comfortable life as I do, right? Absolutely. Simple stuff like mask wearing, location tracking with QR codes could have been kept in place to help, although they are, again, becoming less less useful as the spread increases here now. In Sydney, do you not have to show your vaccination tip when you enter a hospitality venue or anything? That is up to the business's discretion. That is disgraceful. It's pretty bad. Uh, A lot of places have maintained them, um, but they don't have to do it. And they really kind of should. Like, that could be something relatively common sense. But, you know, Dom Parrotted is determined to make everything as open as possible so that businesses can rake in more money. It's great. It's exactly what you want. Surely having a QR detector and showing your ticket at the door is still being open. <laughs> oh, it is. But that, that, that 5% of unvaccinated people could be spending money. <laughs> it's real bad. I hate it. And that is us for today. We have a Patreon. Uh, while I remember to do the ads for it, we have two bonus episodes 
already up there. You also get early episodes if you're at the $10 tier or above. And we are about to record our January bonus episode. So if you want to hear about bullshit statistics, go hop on the Patreon and sign up. But thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. I'll, I'll talk uh, to you. I'll, I'll talk, talk to you, to you later. Very soon. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye.